This month, you may notice, if you watched the month of January 2004 TNA, you may notice the opening theme song to the show is suddenly done by the Macho Man Randy Savage. Or as I thought, literally Jay Lethal. <laughs> Yeah, 2003 Hydro has jumped for Bring of Honor to, to talk about being a man in the opening titles of NWA TNA. Be a man, Hulk. So yeah, the opening theme song, there's actually two of them this month. There's the opening theme song, which they changed on the first show of the month, which is a, like a remixed version of what the theme song was. It's a little more modern sounding, it's a little more upbeat. I actually quite liked it. Yeah, I like both of them. <laughs> and then they make the shift for the rest of January and most of February to the song Are You Ready? It's spelled or you, I have to pronounce it that way. Are you ready? Roo ready? <laughs> Roo ready? It's like Scooby Doo, it's like Roo ready? Roo? It's from Ronnie Savage's 2003 Be a Man album. It's remixed for TNA. There is new lyrics by Randy Savage where he just changes some words basically. So uh, they did change the song to a Randy Savage theme song. It's a very strange theme song. It doesn't make much sense. I can't work out all of the lyrics. I can work out the there's the like the lyrics of the original version, and then the TNA version, which is just basically like copy and paste some TNA lyrics in there. I I have no idea what he's saying. I assume you're going to recite it now for the lovely listeners. All right. So <laughs> we gonna do the damn thing. So I hope you all ready. TNA is gonna rip the wrestling ring like a, I don't know what he says. It sounds like Betty, but I think it's two syllables. It rhymes with ready, I suppose. Don't know. And rock steady. You should never get me started. In this wrestling ring, y'all are you dearly departed. That's a wrestler coming off like this. There's supposed to be a word in there. I can't work out what it is. One that's lyrically inclined with a mic in his fist. It's the Pretty savage good. man with the master plan. I got you waving your hands saying... Oh, did you want me to do it? <laughs> yeah, because it's a, a, it's another female that, that comes in with the last line, so if you'd like to, wait, please. Wait, follow, uh, read me back in again. I got your hands... I got... Wait... God damn it. <laughs> I got you waving your hands. I got you waving your hands saying, That's my jam. Thank you. Those are the lyrics. That You will have heard that in the intro, of course, because, of course, the, the intro song to this podcast is whatever the current theme song is. So you will have heard it on the intro. There will be have no quotes on the intro. I actually tried messing with putting quotes over the Randy Savage song. Did not work. So this month, no quotes in the <laughs> intro, just Randy Savage. I got you waving your hands saying, TNA is the best professional wrestling company in the world. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Randy Savage is doing the, the theme song. So that's their planned main event for the April Bound for Glory event. The April 1st three-hour pay-per-view. They were planning to bring Randy Savage out of retirement to face Jeff Jarrett for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. That's, I don't think that's an awful plan. Well, Randy is not in particularly great wrestling shape these days, but it is a pay-per-view worthy main event. He's a name. That's all that matters. And we do come back to the idea of Randy Savage and Randy Savage against Jeff Jarrett later in the year. And I, I have seen that uh, that clip. Of his debut and then his six-man tag team match. Mm-hmm. And the six-man tag team match being generous. It's a three-on-two handicap match that Savage shows up to at the end. Hmm. So NWATNA hopes Savage will be the marquee name that will make their three-hour pay-per-view appear to be a big deal worth the estimated $30 price tag. And it must be noted, I don't believe at any stage they announced this publicly. I think this was just announced backstage. So at least they, they learned their lesson this time. They didn't announce another hmm. pay-per-view they had to cancel. So the big note from Victory Road, the final point... The debut of the Macho Man Randy Savage strolls out at the end of the show, points at Hall Nash and Jarrett, and that's it. That's our hook for TV. But because it's TNA, Liam, you cannot have somebody like Randy Savage showing up without drama. I mean, I would be disappointed if there wasn't drama. So we talked extensively back in 03 about how TNA wanted to bring in Hulk Hogan, about how TNA wanted to build their first three-hour Sunday pay-per-view around Hulk Hogan. He was meant to wrestle Jeff Jarrett. They delayed that Bound for Glory three times before cancelling it because Hogan wasn't going to show up. Well, guess who showed up to Victory Road 04, Liam? Yeah. The Hulkster himself was just hanging around. <laughs> Didn't want to come hang out? Didn't want to go shoot a segment? Oh, so Randy Savage made a surprise appearance at the end of TNA's Victory Road pay-per-view after negotiations with Sting fell through. They wanted a lot of people. Uh, they didn't get them all, but they wanted DDP for these shows too, but couldn't get them in time. He showed up on TV, though. 
Savage was supposed to come in and what was supposed to be like the beginning of a main event run. Two days later, he cancelled his TV taping appearance, citing the involvement of Hulk Hogan and TNA as his reason. Hogan was invited to in attend the TNA pay-per-view near his Florida home by TNA owner Bob Carter, father of TNA president Dixie Carter. When Hogan arrived, he bumped into Savage. Savage and Hogan have had a love-hate relationship, which we documented on Patreon because we reviewed the Be A Man album. <laughs> Be a man, Hulk. Great song. All-time diss track. But they've had a love-hate relationship over the years. Mostly hate on Savage's side since Hogan's wife Linda provided a safe haven for Savage's then-wife Elizabeth when she was separated from him. Hogan told Savage backstage something to the effect of, You know I've always got your back, bro. Savage snapped back. Yeah, that check will clear. <laughs> <laughs> there was, like, reports that maybe they had a scuffle, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, Savage walked away and avoided Hogan for the rest of the night. Hogan, once again, is like, negotiating with TNA about potentially coming on board, but there, apparently there wasn't serious talks about him actually appearing on camera at uh, Victory Road. You think that he's such a glory hound that he'd just do it? Especially, like, this is a success story for the company and all of a sudden Hulkster's there, you know, smelling like blood in the water. There's a tension for me now as opposed to these shitty asylum shows. Yeah. Savage, now 52, informed Jeff Jarrett late on Tuesday afternoon he wasn't going to attend that evening's taping as scheduled, saying he wouldn't work with TNA as they were working with Hogan. As of last word, TNA had apparently soothed over the problem with Savage and expected him to return to TV the following week. So, you get the debut of the Macho Man. You get what is, like, legitimately, like, a great moment to end the pay-per-view on. A big, like, hook that the Macho Man Randy Savage, one of the biggest stars in professional wrestling of the 20 years prior, has debuted even though he's 52 and not looking quite like the Macho Man anymore. He looks like Jeff Jarrett last outlaw. <laughs> he does! He That's where, clearly, Jarrett got the look from. He also looks like Bonesaw from the Spider-Man films. Striking resemblance. If he, uh, wrestled, he should have won... The bone saw. Yeah. He should have done the bone saw really catchphrase. His classic catchphrase that, that everybody knows and loves from Sam Raimi Spider Man. That's uh, everyone's favorite Randy Savage line. <laughs> it's still it's Randy Savage, big star, and, and in typical TNA fashion, it blows up in their face because fucking Hulk Hogan finally decided to show up. They should have just not invited Hulk. They should have moved on. Well, especially when you get Savage, it's like Savage agrees to appear. Like, not just show up, not just hang around backstage. He agrees to be part of the product in a main event push. Seems to be into it. And, like, that's your program moving forward, Savage and Jarrett, for as good as that's worth. And you blow it up mm. in his face immediately by inviting him in. Like, he claims he felt double-crossed, that the TNA was an unsafe work environment. There was also some, like, thought that he was looking for an out, that he agreed to do the one-off payday for, I think it was 25 grand was the number reported for the... <laughs> and all he does is walk out for 40 seconds. And also, it's not like he's selling pay-per-views. They didn't promote it. Yeah, it was a surprise. So I guess the idea is to come back the next month with the big Savage match to hook everybody, which is it's probably not the worst idea. Well, then sign him to a two-appearance deal at minimum. <laughs> well, that's classic TNA, because they do the same thing with DDP. DDP's first appearance is also without a deal. Great. There's also a bunch of hand-wringing this month about them starting to mention Hall and Nash on TV, also before they had actually put pen to paper. Yeah, well, worked out. <laughs> that worked out fine, but this company learns absolutely nothing. <laughs> so, yeah, so some thought Savage was like taking the payday and then looking for an excuse to back away, something he did do with the, the World Wrestling All-Stars, a, a cursed company that we may be talking about more towards Christmas with our friends yeah, over yeah. in Days of Thunder. But that's our own fault for putting on TV without a contract. Are you going to say it's our own fault for getting involved with Days of Thunder? Oh, it is. They, they Them throwing slander my way on their recent episode. Uh, clearly, I, I shall use my platform here to retaliate and not plug a large yeah, man appears quick, com. Uh, Make a, a horrific rumor about one of them. Dave likes Elon Musk. That's the best I can come up with. Which is a horrific rumor in its own right. is a notorious royalist. Oh, that will hurt Dave personally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you know what I heard? Oh, go on. Garrett, well, I heard that Dave was at Queen Lizzie's funeral and was one of those... Uh, I was hanging out with one of those Tories in like his button-up shirt and, they were, and he was crying on camera. He was one of those who stood in line for like... 27 hours just to see her in, in rest <laughs> yeah i heard dave had a uh, protected tweets <laughs> where he was going after anyone for, that was making light of queen lizzie's death oh the christmas episode's gonna be fun this year <laughs> <laughs> 
Depends if they hear this. <laughs> uh, observers say there were no serious talks about having Hogan appear on camera at the pay-per-view, despite internet reports of the contrary. Hogan spent some time talking with TNA owners Dixie and Bob Carter, whom witnesses describe as marking out for Hogan. They were marking out all show, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, because you could see them. They were, what, third row in the actual stand. So you have the pit, and then you have the stand in front of it. They were, like, third row. If you watch the spot where Abyss is powerbombed to thumbtacks for the first time in TNA history in the Monster's Ball, there's actually a reaction shot of Dixie in there. Fair play to the, the cameraman who got that shot. She was very concerned. It's actually very funny to think about, like, that was an era where no one really knew what Dixie looked like. Well, we only picked up on it because we know now. Yeah, so she wasn't a television character, obviously, at that stage. She was long from being a television character five years away. But also, she just wasn't, like, a particularly visible public figure. So she could probably sit in the crowd. And I'd imagine some people would be like, you know, that's that's the owner of the company. But it's not, like, a thing that, like, she couldn't do that in 2010 without drawing serious attention. She'd sit in, like, the front row in those days on the opposite side of the hard camera, as opposed to, like, being literally in the crowd on the hard camera side. Mm. Fun little Easter egg. Hogan arrived at the pay-per-view and a decked out Mercedes that impressed nearly everybody. He rode to the pay-per-view with Brian Knobs. Savage, on the other hand, arrived with Brian Adams of Chronic Battle of the Brian Entourage. What is this motherfucker's deal with trying to get Brian Knobs into this goddamn company? <laughs> into every company he's ever worked. In fairness, if there's one thing you can say about Hogan, he's loyal to his guys. Even if his guys are fucking dog shit. He's loyal to his guys until he's not. Oh, uh, he's loyal to Eric and... and Frickin' Brutus Beefcake <laughs> and Brian Knobs. Yeah, really excited to relive those those eras. We'll have more drama with Savage coming up going into Turning Point, so you can look forward to that next month. But he does come back, so there's that. It would be a lot funnier if he walked out at the end of your big first three-hour pay-per-view, your big moment is Randy Savage is here, and then he's never seen again. <laughs> I'd be down for it. Which would be the ultimate tribute to the asylum era of people showing up and never being seen again. Yeah, that would be kind of a, a nice little bow on it all. Remember Gorgeous George at the end of the King of the Mountains? Like, Jarrett wins the belt? I, I do. They cut to Gorgeous George in the crowd, and she's seen, like, one other time also in the crowd before disappearing. That's good ti- That's good times. Vader, Road Warriors... Randy Savage made a list of demands before he'd returned to TNA. Among Great. the demands are that he is to, to taken to and from the shows in a limousine, which I guess is why they have 15 limousines at every episode of Impact now. Like, well, we might as well use them. That Brian Adams can be at the shows as his bodyguard, paid, by the way. Also, Ron Harris, apparently, that he has two paid security at all shows. That he have a private dressing room with a lock on the door. And that Jimmy Hart doesn't come anywhere near him in the backstage area because of his relationship with Hulk Hogan. Savage is so paranoid of Hart that he insisted that Hart not be allowed in the gorilla position or the production truck during his matches. Apparently, Savage is concerned that Hart would attempt to sabotage him from a production standpoint in some manner. Garrett, I have a question. Go for it. Is Jimmy Hart there? (laughs) Yeah, he's like a backstage guy. He's not there every week these days, but he does pop up every so often helping out backstage and whipping up fans at Universal. I love the idea... Like, Jimmy Hart's not even a part of the company. <laughs> and Randy Savage is like, you keep Jimmy Hart away from me. And they're like, Randy, we don't... Like, Jimmy's, like, barely here. And like, no, you keep him away. It's like, oh, we fired him for you, Randy. It's like he wasn't here in the first place. But we fired him for you. <laughs> <laughs> and, we, and we kicked him out on the way out just for you, man. Apparently, Savage has not taken off his jacket in front of anybody, which has led to rumors and speculation that he isn't as muscular as he used to be. Uh, which you can see on the pay-per-view. He, like, he's not in terrible shape, but apparently like he had uh, extreme body issues like it brought on by Vince McMahon just being like, be big, be big. Time to cycle back on. Because like, you watch him when he does take the jacket off on the pay-per-view and come out, he, he's, he's he's not Randy Savage anymore. I mean, yeah, but like, do you really expect him to be? Mm. I think that's kind of an unrealistic expectation at this point. Per- but perhaps it isn't if you're booking him and promoting him as such. Yeah, when you're bringing him in as the the, the top guy, your top challenger for the world champion Jeff Jarrett main eventing pay-per-views, you, you do need him to be at least some degree of Randy Savage still. Yeah. Apparently he was uh, less on guard and more like joking around wrestlers more later in the month when he showed up. It's like, Hogan's not here, Jimmy Hart's not here, he, we're good. He's calmed down. And the final news though, Billy Gunn is expected to sign a TNA contract once his 90-day no-compete clause expires. Thank God, Kip James. There has been talk of having him feud or team with BG James. Did you know that the BG and BG James stands for Billy Gunn? Whoa, that's long-term storytelling. Hmm, 
I mean, I'm way more into into Bill Gunn than I am Road Dog. I was gonna say it would be interesting to like go to the alternate reality where Billy Gunn isn't like a television star in AEW at the acclaimed right now to get like yeah. that Liam's reaction to news that Billy Gunn is coming in. I think it would be a lot less positive. Yeah. Oh, you know, you can't fault the man for having a, a good back end to his career. Yeah, for becoming a star all over again. Like, I was never like a giant Billy Gunn fan. I think I always like appreciated him, but it is astonishing that he's, like, managed to be part of, like, a billion hot acts. <laughs> yeah, and especially this TNA one coming up. Oh, the James Hickenbottom! <laughs> oh, I hope WWE demand to hand over that tape, too. They should, they should, and then TNA should do it. <laughs> Just to save us all from it. At the Alamo! <laughs> which brings us to Turning Point, in which the semi-main event, not the main event, was Randy Savage, Jeff Hardy, and AJ Styles facing Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Jeff Jarrett. Earlier in the show, Savage did a promo with Scott Hudson, same thing, ooh yeah, dig it, before he was kidnapped. <gasps> My favorite thing about the kidnapping segment is they don't show them actually shoving Savage into the car. It's all implication. <laughs> they show them throwing Savage's hat into the car, slamming the door, and then the car drives off as Mike Tanay is like, is that Savage? Did they kidnap Savage? Savage, just do the fucking angle. Jesus Christ. Mm. Jump in the car. Have a fucking... I don't know. That that strikes me. Like, they're paying you a shit ton. Just do the bit. You don't even have to wrestle on this show. Hey, he, he works very hard. So you do get the match. It ends up being a three-on-two handicap match for most of its 18-minute run time. <laughs> oh my god, this match was so fucking long. <laughs> this match was impossibly long. And, like irrationally long some would suggest illegally long this should not be so they, they do the three on two it's like it's technically fine there's nothing wrong with it it's not like halls falling over the place or anything but there's there's very little good there until the very last minute which is still not very good but at least randy savage shows up by the way it must be noted before we talk about savage it must be that the kings of wrestling come out to the flying elvis's music <laughs> With tremendous gear. Yeah, where Hall and Nash are wearing Elvis jumpsuits, but Jared isn't. Jared didn't commit to the bit. Why is Jared not committed to this bit? He is. He sucks. Jared stinks. He's ruining it for everyone. <laughs> Jared's a great grifter, but he's no fucking. He's no Kevin Nash when it comes to coolness, is no. he? No. I suppose who is? He wishes he could get as much money for doing as little work as Big Kev did. Not wrong. If Ke if Big Kev was running the. The live event business for AEW right now. We'd all be talking different. Oh, then we'd be getting a bunch of Big Kev against Sting matches. Who would they team Big uh, Big Kev No, with? just put him in the Jared slot where he's with the old X Division guys. The Paparazzi Productions reunion. Oh my... Well, then you have to bring in Alex. Hmm. Hmm. So, Savage walks out, locks Jarrett in a sleeper as the other two lock the other two in a sleeper as well. Then Jarrett goes for a sunset flip. Savage punches him, sits down in the sunset flip, and pins the NWA world champion. Hell yeah. They very clearly present this as the guy just pinned the champion, shouldn't he get a title shot? Which was the plan, but Savage walked out. Yeah, um, how would you feel about Randy Savage versus Jeff Jarrett? Based on what you see of the, like, 30 seconds of them interacting just on this show, I kind of would have liked to see it out of morbid intrigue. How well do you think it would have, um, done? Because they would have insisted on doing, like, a 15-minute match minimum. Oh, 100%. It might be good because Jarrett won't be able to pull his bullshit with Randy. But also Randy can't do anything. Yeah, but Randy can probably walk and brawl with the best of them, so... It's true, they just go all over the entire impact zone. Yeah. They brawl all the way to the asylum and back. So just two days after pitting NWA World Champion Jeff Jarrett at Turning Point, Randy Savage walked out in the promotion. Savage showed up at Universal Studios in Orlando, but ended up having a three and a half hour meeting with Jerry Jarrett, then walked out without appearing on camera as scheduled. His future with the company is unknown, but at this point it appears he is at an impasse over either money or plans on how he wants to be used. He was scheduled to face Jarrett in the main event of TNA's Final Resolution January pay-per-view. The big rumor is basically that... He insisted when he came in, he's not losing to Jeff Jarrett. He's not going to put over Jeff Jarrett. So that when then when they were like, we're going to put you in a pay-per-view main event against Jeff Jarrett. He's like, hey guys, what's the result of that match? <laughs> that, I, that was my first thought was like, there's no way in hell, like if they do that match that Randy wants to lose. Yeah. So when it was became increasingly clear that they wanted him to lose, he's like, fuck it. Peace out. 
which is kind of based to be fair. Yeah, apparently he was making between 10 and 25 grand per show, which is insane money. Also, also maybe Rony just do the job ski. Yeah, like I don't know. Like you're not getting you're not getting signed anywhere else, like just take the money. When you think about the lengths they had to go to to protect him even in a six-man tag, you realize there's yeah. probably a lot going on in Randy's head at this stage of his career. What was Randy Savage's last match? This. This is the last match of the Macho Man Randy Savage's career. Randy Savage, Jeff Hardy, and AJ Styles versus Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Jeff Jarrett. It's kind of an interesting, like, weird wrestling uh, fact, isn't it? TNA have, like, a surprising number of people's last matches. I wouldn't brag about that. No. <laughs> like, they have, like... China's. They had Ric Flair's until Ric Flair had another last match, I guess. Hogan? Uh, Hogan's last match as well. Yeah, so T- that's the, like the weird TNA legacy. I was at Hogan's last match. It was a house show. The last three companies Randy Savage worked. TNA, WCW, New Japan. He did do appearances at WWA. He didn't wrestle. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's the end of Randy Savage's career. The final match of the Macho Man. The final time he was seen on television as a pro wrestler he, he did the acting stuff after this but i mean listen I, I i don't feel like someone who's really educated enough to talk about randy savage's career at length i feel like we have to put what i call the kurt hennig proviso <laughs> mm. if somehow the only match you've seen of randy savage's career is this one <laughs> this one tna yeah. match i would highly recommend you go watch some more randy savage I heard that uh, that Ricky Steamboat Randy Savage match is pretty good. Yeah, it's like a three and three quarter star match, but still, <laughs> P- people seem to like that one. The the biggest disappointment, honestly, is like Savage's thing is his charisma. You know, he is one of the most iconic promos of all time. He doesn't even cut a promo. He all his promos are just like standard. See you at the pay per view. Yeah, you don't even get like a deranged Macho Man promo. They don't even give him like a Randy and Jeff being weird together promo. Mm. Of course, they never let Jeff Hardy talk in general, but, you know. Or I'm just, like, patting AJ on the head. Being like, oh, yeah, you're the future of the business. Um, oh, my God. Imagine AJ trying to keep up with <laughs> Randy Savage and Jeff Hardy. There's, like, a funny moment on the best dams. I'm sorry to bring them up. Where Fuck Chris you. Rose is trying to go, like, banter for banter with Roddy Piper. <laughs> yeah. It's like, even if you think he's a pretty good host, the man can't go barb for barb with Roddy Piper. Uh, yeah, and watching that WrestleMania, it was very funny seeing like Austin and, and Piper going back and forth together. And then it's just like, all right, Carlito, good luck. <laughs> uh, so Savage pins Jarrett. He was meant to challenge in January, but he walked out. And we'll we'll pick that up in January. Don't worry, I'm sure they will bounce back accordingly. So we have Abyss out of the pay per view for reasons, Garza out of the pay per view for reasons, and to follow up on last month, Randy Savage out of the pay per view for reasons. Yeah, but this one could be a positive. A few we've talked to, this is from the Wrestling Observer, shared the viewpoint on Savage we mentioned here, although it's more of a problem of how the company handled it, not any defense. The belief is that when you're talking to a guy like Savage at that level, you should lay out the entire program and get a contract signature and agreement before even starting the program. That seems like... Ah, we call that the the TNA, like, historical problem. (laughs) (laughs) They do be love booking guys before they even have contracts. I suppose they're at that stage where they're like, please, we just need to set appearance. We'll take anything. If it works out, it works out. Savage should never have pinned Jarrett on the assumption he, on the assumption that he would be back to do the job in the singles match on the pay-per-view without it being agreed to. Another aspect not talked about is the long-standing lack of trust stemming from one of the most bitter promotional wars in history between the Poffel family and Jerry Jarrett, even though they made peace when it was over and did business together, and in a sense it was Randy becoming a star in the Jarrett territory against Jerry Lawler that gave him the exposure that led to WWF having interest in him. So the Jarretts and the the Savages don't get along inherently, and now they're just screwing each other over one more time on the way out. That's fun. Uh, Dusty Rhodes and Jerry Jarrett both talked to Savage for 15 minutes on the 7th of December to lay out the scenario of Savage losing at the pay-per-view, and Savage was like, nah, fuck that, I'm going home. That's fair enough. This all happened 15 to 20 minutes before the view started, which threw a monkey wrench into everything since Savage was booked all over the show. Oh no, 15 minutes! (laughs) It's a raw situation throwing these shows together. Uh, one of the funniest lines came from Bobby Heenan when someone noted to him that the Poffos don't trust the Jarrets. Bobby Heenan responded, the Jarrets don't even trust the Jarrets. He's not wrong and he's also the GOAT. 
Uh, Bobby Heenan, which you, who, you, who you will be seeing in 2005. <gasps> there was no clue as to who they would go with uh, in the main event at last word. At the tapings, the idea was to call Sting and try and use him as a stopgap, which they do kind of tease because Dusty Rhodes is like, you won't believe the name on this contract. It's a huge surprise. It's actually a thriller. <laughs> they drop the idea that it's a huge surprise real quick, but they do promote it for a week that it's going to be a big surprise. It's going to shock the wrestling world. Should have just been Dustin Rhodes. Ah, his son. That's nepotism, we call it. Liam. In the, well, you know, regardless. So if you're wondering when, when in that week that they teased it was a big surprise, who were they looking for? The answer is always Sting in TNA history. It's like, who are they looking for? It's Sting. They're always looking for Sting, but Sting apparently is not bothered at the moment. I mean, I think Sting, had been, in comparison to everyone else in like a big title match like that, would have drawn better. Yeah, because Sting doesn't really have, like, the, the sinking WCW stink on him, does he? No, he's like a real star. Yeah, he always had his aura. Even to the very end, he had his aura in WCW. And he, he had a DNA, I guess, too. Yeah, for sure. And like I said, Sting's a TNA guy. Fuck WCW. <laughs> Jerry Lynn is planning to return to the ring in June. At this point, Ooh. he intends to work indie shows on the weekend oh. and continue to work for TNA as an agent. There is always a chance that TNA will want to use him as a talent, but the fact that he Ooh. started as an agent before he worked as a talent has him questioning whether the company wants to let him perform both duties. Oh. Yeah, he does. You will see a Jerry Lynn match this year, but just one. Oh. <laughs> a lot of roller coaster of emotions here in the Jerry Lynn segment. I hope it's Jerry Lynn versus AJ Styles. There is some more context in the Observer at one stage where uh, apparently Jerry is a little uh, hesitant to work with the, the modern X Division guys, partially because he's one of those old school guys who's like, might moves count. But also, I think there's a little bit of him who doesn't think he can keep up anymore. If they're, who'd be killed him? Mm. Right, come on, Jerry, at them. <laughs> Give names. Yeah, the, these these young kids, they're working too fast for Jerry Lynn. Mm. I watched some Jerry Lynn stuff on a certain show today, Garrett. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, on, a, on a certain show that you'll be watching after this is done. Yes, uh, our next episode, which will be in your podcast feed around Christmas, will be the WWA crossover <gasps> episode with Days of Thunder, our friends. Uh, which may, may not seem the case based on what they say on their shows, but they're pals of ours, huh? I mean, the pals of me, for sure. <laughs> well, yeah, me, maybe not. They called me a professional. <laughs> yeah, they just throw me under the bus. Yeah. I mean, I think whoever started that really needs to take a, you know, a, just a long look at themselves <laughs> and see how how words can affect people's online perception. They sure should. They sure mm. should. But that'll be our next show, and then we'll be back in a month with the Against All Odds episode. But we will have Patreon stuff in between. If you like this show, you can subscribe for more Patreon content at patreon.com slash kidding me, tnachad.com. If hour one, hour one. <laughs> I forgot to do it before we transitioned to the news, and I realized that when I went to plug the Days of Thunder episode. So here is the Patreon plug at the end of hour one. But yeah, you can go and we'll be doing the end of the Wrestling Society X series in the next couple of weeks. We'll be doing our 2004 or TNA draft, which I think is always a fun, good time. And our last, uh, our AEW or H draft ended in a draw. So mm. we really need to fight on this one. Our 2004 end of year awards, which as we mentioned, I think of the watch long is probably going to be the most difficult piece of audio we've ever done coming up with some mm. of those award winners. I'm, I'm going to, I'm just still deciding if I want to like fly by the seat of my pants and just do it live or if I want to actually think about it. Mm. You want the emotional reactions. There's something to like choosing on an emotional basis. Yeah, do I want to go off of vibes? But I also, I like to like list like a three and then like have a runner up so we can talk about like who our thirds and stuff was. So mm. who knows? So that'll look up in your pod, yeah, in your Patreon feed over the next month or so before God, our, we I just, guess, we give out so much value for money. Yeah, and, and all the old shows are there. We have, I think, over 90 or 80 pieces of audio. I think it's 90 uh, pieces of exclusive audio. We have our entire Monday Night War series, if you haven't heard it, our entire Ring King series, our entire Global Force Wrestling series, and our ongoing Rain Taker series, of which in the next month we will have the January 4, 2013 Wrestle Kingdom show. A very big, very good show. So we'll be having a review of that and Rain Takers coming up as well in the next few weeks. I'm sure that'll also be like a weird kind of like 
half de facto review of the the, 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 the I was gonna say the real <laughs> Wrestle Kingdom. It's like, oh my god, it's it's the women's World Cup all over again. Um, but we'll be able to talk about the the other one that is current happening con- concurrently, uh, which is a really big show as well. So maybe it's a little like weird mixed joint review thing. And that show will also have hooting and hollering, so I'll watch it. Yeah, hooting and hollering is back basically. So there you go. Gary will, will finally be excited about Japanese wrestling again after three years. Yeah. Actually, like four or five years, because you weren't exactly hot on New Japan before the, the clapping began. Yeah, I was like uh, ahead of the curve on the people who were uh, like uh, getting cold on New Japan, I guess, at the time. Some people have gone to the uh, really far extreme of that. But yeah, the clap grads have just, no, I can't, I can't. <sighs> I want to do this. Um, <laughs> my favorite guy, right? Yes, is the, this 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 current person who's like, oh, I'm gonna like tear down New Japan as if it's still like this hot 2016 thing that's like the biggest thing in wrestling. Mm. Like, I, there was a certain like contrarian thing to being like, aha, everyone's enjoying this thing in 2017. I'm gonna shit on it, right? But like, 20 people are watching it now. You're just punching down. <laughs> <laughs> Move on with your life. Like, seriously, like, go hate other the things that are popular. Go, like, shit on, like, Raw and SmackDown because people like them now. Go shit on Dynamite. Like, go shit on stuff that people actually <laughs> enjoy it and are talking about. <laughs> like, New Japan has one good thing happen to them or, like, one match that people are like, oh, that was pretty good. And, like, everyone just goes, oh, classic New Japan. Got to <laughs> Let's stop tearing them down. Lol. Kota Ibushi and Naito in the Hall of Fame. Like, that's so funny when it's like, they, they, they don't do anything now. What do you want from them? <laughs> the New Japan Defender has logged on. They don't even have crowds that make noise. And you still punch them down at them. Mm. Uh, it's just, a, it's, there are, there are actual things that are worth, like, shitting on, or like, or at least, uh, relevant. 